Hey there, welcome back to our Sky Tonight program. My name is Seth Mayo. I'm the curator of astronomy for the Loma Planetarium at MOAS. And as we sunset the month of February, we're going to cover the dates of February 28th through March 6th. And we'll start things off by talking about a nice conjunction of Mercury and Saturn in the early morning that you have an opportunity to see. Then we'll talk about a conjunction of Mars and Pluto, that tiny dwarf planet. And we'll end this episode by looking ahead at what's to come for the month of March. So let's get to it. Right now in the early morning is the best time to view planets visible to your naked eyes. And there's some bright ones here. But on the morning of Wednesday, March 2nd, we have two planets that are getting fairly close to each other, something called a conjunction. And this particular conjunction doesn't happen too often, and that's between the large planet Saturn and the smallest planet in the solar system, Mercury. So if we look carefully, just above the east and southeastern horizon, you may catch a glimpse of these two objects down here that are fairly close to one another. And keep in mind that this is just after six in the morning. This may be a little challenging because you're gonna be competing with the sun's light as the sun is about to rise here. So that may make it a little more difficult and this is very low in the sky. So you're looking through a little bit more of the atmosphere as you do so. But there's always a chance to see it and so it's worth mentioning. So what we have here is the planet Mercury that's a little bit brighter. Even though it is smaller than Saturn, Mercury is a lot closer to us. And then, just to the left of it, we have the planet Saturn right there. So that's really, really nice. And what's great is they're passing within less than a degree apart in separation. So they're less than a full moon width apart, which is really, really nice. So if you do have a telescope or binoculars and you take a look carefully, of course, because the sun is nearby, you could catch these two, especially with Saturn and its rings, which are always great, and little Mercury not too far off. So that's kind of nice. Again, this conjunction doesn't happen too often because Saturn moves so slowly in the sky and it doesn't have too many opportunities to get fairly close to Mercury. So that's kind of nice to see these two planets so close, especially on the morning of March 2nd. Now, as we move ahead just one morning after on Thursday, March 3rd, what we find is a conjunction of two more objects in the sky. But this time, you won't see one of the objects. So we still have it centered on Mercury and Saturn. We go just one more morning to the third, and you'll see they've moved a little farther apart, but still fairly close, while you see Saturn is actually rising higher in the sky and getting a little bit easier to see morning to morning, which is nice. But if we look a little higher up, we have the planet Venus up here, and then just below it is Mars. And the two I'm actually mentioning is Mars and the tiny dwarf planet Pluto will be at conjunction on Wednesday, March 3rd. Now, Pluto is a planet you cannot see with your naked eyes. It is very, very far away from us. So to help us find where Pluto is, we're gonna search that here in Stellarium and we'll select that here and there it goes. So we're just gonna zoom in just a little bit more to give us a better view of this here. So these two planetary objects will be getting within a degree of each other. And yes, I say planetary because Pluto is still a dwarf planet. It still has planet in its name. So you can consider it a planetary object along with Mars, of course, as well, the red planet you see right up here. And these two objects will also be coming within a degree of each other. So about a full moon width apart, just a tiny bit less. So that's pretty close. And even though you can't find Pluto, if you had a really big telescope and you could point towards this tiny dwarf planet, there is a possibility to see it as this very, very dim point of light. So it is really, really tough. So again, big observatories, big telescopes are usually the devices that are able to capture Pluto. Or if you're a spacecraft, like the only spacecraft to fly by it back in 2015, and that was the New Horizons probe. The New Horizons spacecraft that flew by after a nine year journey through space. It had to travel a huge distance, more than 3 billion miles to Pluto from Earth, so really, really far and also going really fast, still taking nine years, and it flew by Pluto. So it couldn't slow down and get into orbit around Pluto. It was just a quick flyby. But when New Horizons flew by, it gave us tremendous pictures of the surface of Pluto. 
And we thought it wouldn't be a very dynamic place because Pluto is smaller than our own moon. As the spacecraft flew by and took a whole bunch of pictures, we saw an interesting icy landscape with ice plains and glaciers. And some of this ice we think is being replenished from water and liquid nitrogen and other very cold materials that bubble up from underneath, freeze, and then create new terrain above. And that we found primarily in that very big heart shape called Tombaugh Regio, named after Clyde Tombaugh, who discovered Pluto back in 1930. And we've been seeing this kind of reddish sort of area west of that giant heart shape. And that's basically from something called tholins, which are materials made of carbon base molecules or organic molecules that are infused together by radiation from the sun. And those can be red, and so they snow down on Pluto. So Pluto has red snow on its surface. So we've seen that on the western flank of the heart of Tombaugh Regio. So we saw that, some of the other moons of Pluto as well got a little bit of an up-close look, especially its largest moon, Charon. And Charon is half the size of Pluto, and they orbit around each other. It's a really peculiar system. So Pluto's always been kind of an oddball, far from us, with a tilted orbit taking almost 250 years to go around the sun, smaller than our moon. It's an amazing little world that tells us a lot about the outer solar system. So New Horizons was a marvelous mission in helping us to understand this. But anyway, on Thursday, March 3rd, you will just know that Pluto will get fairly close to Mars in the sky, even though you probably won't see it unless you had the right equipment to do so. It's still nice to know that these two worlds will be at conjunction here this very morning. Now, as we look ahead at the celestial events for March, we can go back to that early morning sky where we've been looking lately, where we'll find again Venus and Mars. But by Saturday, March 12th, is when they'll be at conjunction, or at least the closest they're gonna get right now. These two planets have been kind of huddling together fairly close, but now finally, their separation has gone down to about four degrees apart. And we can actually label that here in Stellarium. It'll show it's actually just less than four degrees, almost there, because there are 60 arc minutes in a degree. So this is at 59 arc minutes so just under four degrees apart. So that's about eight full moon widths apart. So if you really wanna know that separation, if you hold your fist out at arm's length, the width of your fist is about 10 degrees. So the angular separation between these two objects on the morning of Saturday, March 12th, will be actually less than half of the width of your fist held at arm's length. So that's pretty close to each other, seeing Venus, the brightest planet in our sky, and Mars, just to the south of it, fairly close by this date. And these planets will still be fairly close, even up to the 15th. This is the 12th, there's a 13th, 14th, and 15th of March, right in the middle of the month there. And they'll still be within about four degrees apart over those three or four days before they start to move away from each other as we get later into the month. On Friday, March 18th, we have a full moon for the month of March, and the moon at this time of year is called the Worm Moon. So we have the full Worm Moon, and also at this time of the year, the full moon is situated inside the constellation of Virgo the Maiden, which to me kind of looks like the Big Dipper in the sky, but in the wrong place. This is not the Big Dipper, but the stars seem a little bit similar. But anyway, this is Virgo, one of the signs of the zodiac, and you'll find the moon kind of situated right in that constellation. So expect a large moon by then. On Tuesday, March 20th, we have the equinox coming up already. For us in the Northern Hemisphere, this is the vernal equinox, or the first day of spring. For those in the Southern Hemisphere, this is the autumnal equinox, the first day of fall. And as we've talked about before, this is the moment when the path of the sun and moon, or the plane of our solar system, called the ecliptic that we find here, crosses the celestial equator that divides the sky into a northern and southern section. So we have equal amount of day and night, and this is one of two times a year when the sun rises exactly east and sets exactly west. So we're already at the equinox here in March coming up. Also on the 20th of March, in the early morning this time, we have Venus again, situated in a position called Greatest Elongation West, when it's farthest from the sun in our sky, and generally about the highest it gets above our horizon. And Venus still is shining tremendously bright, which is great. And just a morning after, Venus will be at something called dichotomy. And we've talked a little bit about this recently with the phases of Venus. So let's move ahead to the 21st 
and zoom in, and you will see that's when Venus is at half phase. So if you do have a telescope or even binoculars, and you have a chance to look at Venus, you'll see half of the planet lit from our point of view. And that's kind of nice to see these phases sort of play out. So that's what that means. Venus at dichotomy. You see this dichotomy between the dark and night side of this planet shrouded in a thick cloud of carbon dioxide that we see here. And for the last week of March, starting on Sunday, March 27th, we have the thin crescent moon joining again these planets in the early morning sky towards the east and southeast. But by then, the planets have shifted around a bit from earlier in the month here. So this is the 27th, we'll move on to the 28th here, and you'll see the moon get even closer to Mars, which is located there. This is Saturn here in Venus, which you notice have gotten fairly close by then. We'll continue on to the 29th here, and by the 29th, when the moon is a very thin crescent, we go back to Venus and Saturn, and those two planets will be at conjunction, or about the closest they're gonna get right now in our sky within about two degrees apart just over two degrees so about four full moon widths apart so that's still very very close with mars not too far off so we end march with a nice grouping of these three planets and the waning crescent moon and lastly as we take a look at the general constellations and stars we can see for the month of march we can look pretty high at this time of the year and still have a great view of those wintertime constellations that really bleed into most of the spring as well. So this is a good time in the evening, right when it's dark out, and we'll find pretty high up and a little bit towards the south here. We can find the likes of Orion the Hunter, who is still great at this time of the year. Not far from him, Taurus the Bull to his right or to the north of him. To his south here, we have the bright star Sirius there, part of Canis Major. Is also a smaller dog here, this star Procyon, part of Canis Minor. And we have the Gemini Twins, you can see above Orion's Club here. And still we have Auriga the Charioteer with that bright star Capella. And as we've talked about before, some of these stars, six stars in particular, form the great winter hexagon or winter diamond that we still have a great view of right now. And if we look over to the east, we'll see even better view of Leo the Lion that we find right here. So that's nice. For our last episode, we featured Leo. If you want to know a little bit more about this mighty lion from Greek mythology, you can check back with that episode. So there it is with its bright star Regulus that you find there. And in the spring, it's great to look out for the Big Dipper here in the Northern Hemisphere. That's when the Big Dipper is easy to find right when it's dark. So there is the Big Dipper we can find there. And if you didn't know already, the Big Dipper is not a constellation. It's an asterism, a nice star shape that's a little easier to spot and to find in the sky. But the Big Dipper is actually part of the constellation called Ursa Major, this great bear, along with the North Star. Because if you find that Big Dipper, the end of the bull points you to the North Star here called Polaris, which is part of the Little Dipper and also Ursa minor so that's kind of nice to see that there and if we continue to circle around here we'll see some of those fall constellations finally begin to set some of them almost never set because they're so close to the northern part of the sky but by the spring you'll see them very low like cassiopeia this kind of w shape right here maybe still a little bit of perseus you find there and even andromeda not too far away as well so these constellations either they're high up they're setting or rising here are great for the month of March. I hope we can find these beautiful groups of stars that are out right now. Well, that's it for another edition of our Sky Tonight program. Thank you very much for tuning in. And if you find yourself in Daytona Beach, please stop by the Museum of Arts and Sciences and definitely catch a show in our Loman Planetarium. We're running shows daily. And if you want any more information about those programs, please check online on our website. So with that, we hope to see you back here again. Take care, and of course, happy stargazing.